A good starting point is kind of to understand where we're at. Um, uh, I know that, was it France, we, there's about 60 reactors? I think 56. 56 maybe, yeah. reactors. We know in the UK, I think there's about three. I don't, what's the size of the fleet here in the US? 92. 92. I like the fact they call it a fleet. We've heard a lot about uh, the difficulty in trying to get new nuclear plants uh, commissioned and also built. It, it takes a long time. What impact has that had in terms of the current fleet? Uh, is it aging to the point that some of these need decommissioning? What, what's the current status of the fleet? So reactors in the United States were originally licensed for 40 years. And then all of them, uh, almost all of them, have been extended to 60 years. And some of them, um, and more and more, will be extended out to 80 years. So we're going to operate the fleet here, for the most part, out to 80 years. Um, and then what we've seen over time is there was some shutdowns, premature shutdowns, we call them, uh, for economic reasons. So in certain areas, um, dealing with wind and solar and transmission constraints created some economic challenges for them. That dynamics shifted a bit now. And what we're seeing here in the United States is the fleet is going strong. We operate 24-7, 365. Um, and we operate for 18 to 24 months before we shut down for refueling. And many of the plants will operate what we call breaker to breaker. So from the time they start up to the time they shut down, they're pretty much running at full power or close to full power. Talk to me about refueling. So refueling, when we shut down a reactor, we take out about a third of the core right now for the existing fleet and um, then put that in a spent fuel pool. So basically a large pool of water, it sits there for a while, a few years, and then we move it into a dry cask storage system. Yeah, Jared, uh, Anthony Jared brought up yesterday that in the smaller, newer reactors, are these these uh, generation four mm -hmm. reactors, that it's a possibility that you can take these fuel rods from the uh, old kind of aging fleet and they can still be used in the newer design. Yeah, so let me talk about what we're doing at Oaklo for a yeah, second. tell me. So our machine, as I said, is a liquid metal fast reactor. So um, it's designed to uh, stay operational for a couple decades without refueling. So for one, extending out that time between when you need to refuel. Just very quickly, how long does a refueling process take? So for the fleet, they can get it done I'd say on average about 30 days. Okay. Wow. They bring in a, a lot of people in yeah. uh, to supplement the workforce. They lay out everything they need to do and they go with it. What happens during that 30 days in terms of, is there no power coming from? That's the grid? correct. Okay, the, so you have to what, plan additional elsewhere power? Yeah, for the grid. Yeah. Uh, and they do most of the, um, here in the United States, most of the refuelings occur in the spring or the fall. So you they don't need the air conditioners and you don't need the heaters. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. You tend not to do it in the middle of the summertime. Okay. Sorry. I'll let you carry back. Yeah. So for us, um, you were just talking about reusing of yeah. commercial fuel. So one of the things we are planning to do is recycling. So we're planning to take some of that spent fuel coming out of the existing fleet and then recycle it and use it as feedstock fuel for our reactors. And then eventually we'll also recycle the fuel that's coming out of our reactors. So we have that capability with a, it's a, as I said, we have a fast reactor, so that has the capability to um, reuse that fuel in an efficient way. Does that change the volume of the nuclear waste or just the makeup of it? A little bit of both. So it changes the makeup of it in the sense that what you end up disposing of now are just what we call fission products. So right now when spent fuel comes out of a reactor, it has in it uranium, plutonium, actinides, which are higher level elements. It has the fission products. Um, when we do the recycling, we're going to keep the major actinides and the, um, the transuranics together. Uh, along with the uranium and the plutonium. And so what will be left is fission products. So it does change the makeup of it a bit. Um, and it does reduce the uh, amount of waste. Right. Okay. So going back to the current fleet, mm -hmm. um, a lot was made of in California that Ga I think it's Gavin Newsom wanted to shut down like their last reactor. Diablo Canyon. Yeah. And they haven't. That's correct. So was the reason... Uh, to close it down, not so much that it was aging. Was that more of a political reason? And yeah. you would say this, what, you say this reactor is absolutely fine to carry on for another 20 years? 
Yeah, in fact, it is, it is for sure. Um, they're planning to keep it operational for at least another five years beyond the lifetime. I would hope that that would go for further than that. But yes, that plan is perfectly capable of continuing to operate. And mm -hmm. that's a political political reasons over there, you know, that California's, California's um, <laughs> it's, it's an internal issue. You must bang your head against the wall though. Think, what are you doing? Um, it's, yeah, it's frustrating a bit sometimes looking yeah. at how decisions are made, but that's true of everywhere. Do these uh, older reactors, is there any issue with recruitment of staffs like human resource or is there plenty of people wanting to come into the industry? So that's a good question too. Um, we, the, the industry as a whole, does a lot of work in terms of training workforce and we interface with um, local colleges, community colleges, things like that, to help make sure that we have programs in place to train the people we need. Now, as we go forward and we build out more and more reactors in the United States, which I certainly hope we will do um, and expect that we will do, workforce is gonna be an issue. We're gonna need to get more people trained up to operate the reactors. Construction workforce is a big deal. I mean, the amount of infrastructure that we are gonna need to build out is just gonna be enormous. So um, we think there could be, for example, in the United States, upwards of 160 gigawatts of new nuclear built between now and 2050. That's an enormous amount of number of machines. What does that compare to the current fleet? So current fleet is about 90 uh, gigawatts. So what's that, about 150%, 160% increase? Uh -huh. Yeah, wow, okay. And in terms of the skills, you said, say, for construction, but are those specialist construction skills? Some yes, some no. Yeah. It depends. And so what we're seeing with some of the newer reactor designs like ours, we're moving into smaller machines that are going to be easier to build, easier to construct, and not be these um, mega projects. So down in Georgia, we're building, completing, I should say, two reactors, Vogel 3 and 4. They're a Westinghouse AP1000 plants, fabulous plants. They're currently, AP1000s are currently operating in China. Um, what Southern companies should be bringing online these two plants this year uh, down there. But they are mega projects, huge projects, huge construction projects. Um, and that's a challenge in the United States. So what you're seeing with small modular reactors, all advanced, advanced reactor companies are looking at smaller machines that'll be easier to construct, move as much of that fabrication as we can back into a factory setting, and then just ship stuff to the site and install it. Wow, will it almost be the case that uh, multiple locations could have almost identical reactors? They should, yes. They should. Yeah, in fact, the Vogel 3 and 4, so you're going to see down there in Georgia um, at the Vogel plant, they have currently two reactors operating, then three or four are 100% identical. Wow, okay. So when you, I mean, you, you said earlier that you work for the, the trade association. I did yeah. previously, yes. Yeah, the green lobbyists have been very effective at scaring people off of nuclear energy, I mean, especially in Europe. Uh, I mean, Germany tried to shut down, I think, their last three reactors. They've had to keep them going. Right. Um, where do you think the nuclear industry itself has failed in countering their arguments? Because from everyone I've spoken to, actually, the green lobbyists should probably be pro-nuclear because nuclear is the best opportunity we have to decarbonize. You're seeing a lot right now over the last few years, well, not few anymore, last five to 10 years, a big shift um, with climate change and carbon reduction being the key, infer key and um, challenge. You're seeing a lot of support for nuclear now, especially in the United States with a number of the other organizations out there. Um, so I think the momentum behind nuclear is growing more and more with climate change. Uh, so I think we're in a very good path moving forward to build out a lot more nuclear to do provide that zero carbon emitting energy, you know, 24-7, 365. So you feel like there is like a changing tide? Oh, it's changed. The tide has changed. I mean, we're seeing a lot of activity going on in the United States. We've seen um, with Congress uh, here, um, bipartisan bills passed, uh, huge support from the government in, well, just in the last two years, there was a bipartisan um, 
the, the Infrastructure Act, yeah. uh, Infrastructure Bill, and then the Inflation Reduction Act that was just passed last year. So the inflation Infrastructure Bill was the previous year. Um, both of those provided huge support for nuclear, as well as other renewable sources, production tax credits and things like that. And here in the United States, we have a program, the Department of Energy has a program called the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, which was funded by Congress. And you're seeing two reactors that are going to be demonstrated by 2030, one in Wyoming, one in Washington State, uh, by companies TerraPower in Wyoming and X Energy in Washington State. Then you see private entities like ours, Oklo, developing a reactor. We plan to have ours operational at Idaho National Laboratory in 2026. And then um, there's a number of other companies developing reactors that are going to be operational here in the U.S. before 2030. And these are new designs. Okay, we're going to get into that. The um, was it 160 gigawatt? You said that was going to come online. That's what an estimate is. So we the uh, nuclear industry um, NEI went out and talked to its member companies and got an estimate of about 90 gigawatts of new nuclear that could be deployed between now and 2050. There's been some other estimates as high as 100, 300 gigawatts of new nuclear and so 160 or so is kind of a round number but you know these are estimates yeah they're never accurate yeah but the point is you're seeing a lot of interest in building out new nuclear uh, in addition to the fleet which ultimately will have to be replaced yeah and just to give the listeners some perspective and understand it myself as well um 160 gigawatt when you say that number is that a daily amount an annual amount Oh, so when I say gigawatts, that's the amount of power being produced instantly. So it's the amount of power that's coming out of the plant. At um, a constant rate. Con- rate. Yep. Okay. And so to give us an idea of perspective, what is the kind of uh, the amount about that America needs, kind of amount of energy it needs to be produced? Okay. So um, I said that right now the fleet in the United States produces about 90 gigawatts of power. Yeah. Um, we currently supply about 19 to 20% of the electricity in the US. So of the US electricity consumption, 19 to 20% of that's nuclear. So you can kind of do the math. So and it's about 450. Yeah, yeah, something like that probably. Interesting. Um, there has been a big decline in investment in nuclear over the last couple of decades, maybe not just now, but there had been a period of decline. Um, in terms of regulation, how how much did that call how how much did that contribute to the kind of decline in uh, investment and is regulation changing to help with new reactors coming online because and, and, and again more of a broader question is the regulation now t- still too tight well i'm not going to say it's too tight it's um you need strong regulations to you know, we have a very robust regulatory system in the United States, a very safe operating fleet in the United States, um, and that's a joint effort between the regulator and the industry. Okay. Now, where the challenge comes in is becoming efficient in doing the regulatory procedures, licensing new reactors efficiently, um, giving credit where credit is due for new designs that are more inherently safe than the existing fleet. Um, the investment right now in new nuclear is enormous. Uh, it's hard for me to comment about previous investment, but right now the investment going on in new nuclear is just enormous. And the regulator is um, trying to get prepared. There's more work to be done there to become more efficient there. And to me, I'm convinced that each of the designs out there, ours and the others, will be able to be licensed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the U.S., Um, And in fact, there's an application in front of NRC right now that they're going to finish up in about 24 months. Um, So it's for a test reactor, not a commercial reactor. So I'm convinced the NRC can do it. Now, where the challenge comes in down the road is talking about that 160 gigawatts or so, you know, you're looking at 300 more, 300 reactors or more that need to be built. And that's just for electricity. How does the Nuclear Regulatory Commission get efficient to be able to do that many machines? How does the regulatory system throughout the world be able to become efficient enough to license the number of machines that we need to do to actually combat climate change? Yeah. So what are the parts of the regulatory system that 
perhaps slow things down? Is it finding locations? Is it the what what would slow things? You say it has to kind of like you're more saying it has to modernize. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so right now, reviews take twenty four to thirty six months, depending on the um, type of design that's out there. And yeah, that's a review of the des- the design of the reactor. Correct. But if if that is approved, would it still a nuclear location have to be reviewed again, even if it's well, so this is part of what needs to be looked at is can we do things more efficiently? Yeah. Environmental issues are obviously a, a, a valid concern everywhere. Yeah. You need to look at the appropriate environmental things, but can you streamline that effort, especially as you get down to smaller machines? Can you streamline the environmental reviews? Can you streamline the um, safety reviews for subsequent machines? So, you know, you license the first one, then you do the second one, third one, fourth one, fifth one, tenth one. How can we take advantage of what we've already done in a very efficient way? Yeah, because two to three years for the license is a long time. It is. It would seem ludicrous if if you're creating the IKEA of nuclear reactors to actually go through that again. What Do you know how long it takes once they find a location? So we tend to run, so let me come at it this way. Um, if we look at the advanced reactor demonstration program that DOE is putting, and this is a very efficient program. So the um, the two companies were chosen in 2020. They plan to be operational in 2027, 2028, or by 2030. So you tend to look at about a decade from the time you say go um, with us and f- have a site to the time you have a reactor up and running. And that's gonna be reduced quite a bit. I mean, we are, we're hoping, we believe our reactor, again, and we're designing, by the way, I should have said this earlier, we're designing machines that are up to 15 megawatt electric, whereas the Vogel plants are like 1,100 megawatt electric. So we're designing small machines. We believe we can build those in about a year. Okay, so just, hmm. when you say when you've got go on the site, but but I'm, I kind of want to understand the entire time scale. So say a city is considering uh, a new, new mm-hmm. reactor and, and they have to find a site. So it's almost just from the point of going, okay, we want a reactor. For, is, that, is it then 15 years or is it 12 years? Uh, no, it's, so you're going to have to, you say you want a reactor, okay, then you have to find a site. Um, that's probably not going to take too long to do. Because okay. you'll have, you'll know what the infrastructure is. You'll look at things like transmission, distribution, stuff like that, how you're going to connect it up to the grid. So you find your site, then you'll have to prepare the license application that goes into NRC. So you pick a company that already has a design, you still have to prepare a license application to go into the NRC. That's probably a year, year and a half. Then from there you go on and put it in front of NRC. You're looking two to three years now, uh, hopefully two years or less to get that done. Then you start construction, depending on the plant design, something like ours, you're looking at about a year. Others you could be looking two to four years. So you can see how that time frame yeah, I see, goes I see. out. Yeah, um, it would. I guess there would be a, a different constraint on you if they streamlined everything and they could uh, move to the point where they give you the nod and a reactor could be up in a year. If you suddenly got an order mm-hmm. yourself for like ten to fifteen of them, how do you, as a company, resource up? There would there would be constraints on the company themselves. Well, of course, but it's not like you're going to have this instantaneously. You're going to see it coming. So yeah. we're, we're engaged with multiple potential customers out there and looking at what their needs are and understanding it. So, but to your point, we all have to scale up yeah. as necessary to be able to deliver the machines. And that's going to be, that's a challenge for the industry as a whole.